Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. Interesting conversation today with Han Allred. Han is a filmmaker, and you might recognize the last name. He's the son of Mike Allred. He is making a documentary called Space Face about uh, the life of Mike Allred, his career, and his personal story as well. And it's a story that you may or may not have heard about. But uh, certainly we talk about uh, how... Mike's personal struggles impact his art, both positively and negatively. Um, Really interesting stuff uh, that's going to make for a very unconventional comic book documentary. You'd expect no less if it's covering the career and art of Mike Allred. But again, that's just the B story, as Han explains. In this conversation, Han has a Kickstarter underway for the documentary called Space Face, and he's here to talk about it and uh, ask for your help. It's a great conversation on today's Word Balloon. All brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, as always, League, for your support via Patreon. Uh, if you like what you hear at Word Balloon and want to hear more of it, go to patreon.com slash word balloon and uh, click on the Patreon ad. But as always, I appreciate your support and interest, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. They're having a great month. You know, uh, John Lehman's brand new Man Who Effed Up Time just debuted. Uh, there's new coming uh, stuff like Zach Thompson's Undone My Blood. There's God Killers by Mark Sable. Coming in just a few weeks, you'll want to check out Stephanie Phillips' brand new Pulp Adventure from Aftershock. Artemis and the Assassin. It sounds great. A World War II story. Totally up my alley. And Pulp Adventure? What are you kidding me? You had me at a low, Stephanie. Nice going. These are some of the great books that are out there from Aftershock that are about to join the ranks of such great books as uh, Marguerite Bennett's Animosity with Raphael De La Tour and Donnie Cates and Baby Teeth with Gary Brown, Walk Through Hell, Garth Ennis and Gordon Suzuka. Their catalog is filled with great books from Paul Jenkins, Tim Seeley, Phil Hester, Cullen Bunn, Brian Azzarello, so many more. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and how to get these books digitally through the diamond codes to your local shop at AfterShockComics.com. All right, let's get into it. Let's talk to Han Allred about his documentary Space Face, all about the life and career of Mike Allred, and uh, the Kickstarter that uh, he's hoping you will uh, contribute to to uh, make this the best documentary possible. Very interesting take on the comic book documentary. Not your usual uh, meat and potatoes with this one. Han Allred on today's Word Balloon. Han Allred, welcome to Word Balloon, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you on today. Yeah, thanks, John. Well, and it, uh, we should talk uh, and get this out of the way. I am saying it properly. It is Han. Yep, Han like Han Solo. So uh, I think anybody who knows my dad has looked into his work, sees that he's obsessive for pop culture uh, to, to the point where I'm named after Han Solo. My brother's Bond after James Bond. Outstanding. That's fantastic, man. And then, like, are you are you guys cool with that, or like, I mean, how do you guys feel as the re- receivers of these things? <laughs> oh well, we're we're obviously cool with it. Uh, we, I mean, we we're both fathers, and I have a sister named Kelby, which she kind of got the shaft when it came to the pop culture <laughs> names. <laughs> I was going to say, what reference is that? There is none. Okay, I like that name. That's a great name too. But all of us like <laughs> have kids. And our kids all have pop culture names, too. So I, I have an Anakin. I have a Frank Einstein, actually, so after <laughs> Madman. My my brother has a Ringo and a Ray. Outstanding. Uh, and, then, and then my sister has a Bowie and a Ripley. Outstanding. Well, that's yeah. great, man. Now, you're, you're, you're joining us today because you're, uh, you're making a documentary about your father. And, uh, and you're going to do a Kickstarter campaign for this, correct? Well, yeah, the Kickstarter is going to start the 18th, then it's going to be a 30-day campaign, and yeah, there's going to be all kinds of goodies as rewards, prints, t-shirts, all kinds of fun stuff, and there's a lot of really cool people involved, so I'm really excited about what I've been able to accomplish over the last year working on this. I've got some really cool people to participate, and I'm, I'm excited to see this continue to move forward and get to the point where... Or I could share this. So tell me, are you looking to finish the film? I mean, what, what stage of the documentary would you say the film is in right now? It's in, like, early rough edit stage. Okay. I've obtained about 30 interviews. I have, uh, you know, like, storyboards. So I'm, like, deep into the story structure and what I want and what I'm trying to portray. And, like, you know, the, the heart of what I'm after here. Which really, 
at the core, this is a movie about seeking meaning in life. So I think this is something that my dad struggles with and has ever since he was a little kid. And it's what interested me. It's what had me dive into this in the first place. I've been big into documentaries for quite a while. Anything from just crazy stuff to PBS documentaries, whatever. I'm really just interested in the perception of others. And I think one reason for that is as a, a teenager, seeing my dad kind of lose it and go into one of these episodes that just seemed as though he was like, I, you know, I felt like I lost him and it shook up my whole world and changed my perception about everything has caused me to become more of a seeker and uh, constantly challenging my own belief system. But so really a lot, a lot of this movie is just about seeking, seeking meaning through the interviews with my dad and how he deals with these episodes through like both just real life day to day as well as like how they're written into Madman, which is Madman is him. So wow, he is he is Frank Einstein, and a lot of this is written into his comics. I think, and from talking to him, like as though even possibly a plea for help. Wow, that's amazing, man. That's that's uh, surprising to hear. And I, as you described it, I guess I did in the past hear that that uh, Mike, you know, had would you, would you call it? Uh, uh, you said it, like uh, depression or anxiety. I mean, how how would you so how it, how's it been characterized? So, like in preparation for this, I I jumped in and started reading all these back interviews, watching everything I could on YouTube, which there's a a, a few interviews, and I'd see it come up, but it always seems to be something that's kind of just brushed over, not seen for the depth at which I feel it really is, which is. Like people tend to think, oh yeah, you're, you know, you're just a deep thinker. You have these episodes of depression, but I think that my dad is basically always tripping. Wow. I think that he's always, I think that he may have an, like a overactive pineal gland or something that he's kind of just always tripping. When you say tripping, like always saying in anxiety, uh, as far as no, that no, goes? no, I'm, I'm saying like, for the most part, I think he's having a good trip. Oh, okay. So, like, the medication to help him with his anxieties and depression, I'm assuming. Well, no, he doesn't take medication, and he's – and this this anxiety thing isn't, like – it's not sustained. What it, what it is is I think that he basically is – like, you read into his work, and you, you would think that he's taking psychedelics and experimenting with things that he's definitely not. He doesn't do any drugs. He doesn't drink coffee. He doesn't drink alcohol. Forgive me, because then I hope I wasn't disrespectful asking about medication and stuff. Um, no. Your, your family is a Mormon family, correct? Uh, I'd say we were a Mormon family. Okay. But I think I think we've all broken free from that. Oh, okay. Wow. Wow. And is that even in the documentary as well? Oh, of course. That's a big wow. part Wow. Okay. I we'll mean, get so- to that in a second. But maybe you guys, and again, as you say, you were part of the Mormon church. That I, uh, you know, I know, and and then I realized, well, yeah, no, you, you know, you don't, you don't drink caffeine, you don't, you don't do uh, drugs and stuff like that, and they grew up in that kind of, you know, upbringing. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, now my mom's drinking wine, and my okay. dad, he's smoked pot a time or two, <laughs> okay. but like it's, it's not, it's not even, it's not his thing. I'm hip, okay, but the yeah, so so he's just naturally tripping all the time. So he. He is like this happy, vibrant, you know, pop culture obsessed guy that you think he is. The thing that I'm kind of tackling here, the conflict is that he goes through these reoccurring episodes. This isn't some sustained, prolonged, he's always depressed kind of thing because he's not. He's, he's happy and he definitely gets a lot out of life. But every five years... So when he was five years old, he remembers having his first episode, is what I'm calling them. And so when he was five, he was laying back in bed. He started thinking about time and space and you know where space ends. And as he's thinking about this stuff, he basically triggered himself into an out of body, you know, psychedelic esque experience that 
like frighten him. Just the idea of infinity, like so infinity, eternity. These are things that terrify him. So as to where, as to where I think most people are afraid of death, he's afraid he's going to live forever. And so the first episode he had when he was five, he went through all sorts of stuff in his teenage years and then has had these episodes like from early adulthood to current day just about every five years since. So every about five to six years. And so like for people who've like followed his work, like when he was doing the image work, he was going through one of those episodes. So that 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 issue where he's he's illustrating Frank Einstein in all these different artist styles, this loss of loss of identity. I mean, he was going through that. To me, that's the spine of this movie is questioning existence through these episodes. Him and Madman and the parallels between them with questioning existence with the B story. Like I think if anybody else made this film, uh, they'd make the film that I didn't want to make. And that's the film. That's the B story. It is all entertaining stuff. And I know people want to see it, but like he does have this fascinating story of just like early thirties, quitting the air force to pursue indie comic books to becoming who he is today. Like there, there is a fascinating story there and it's part of this. But really, like, the the main story here is questioning existence in these moments of existential crisis. And as I've been going around interviewing all these people, I'm, I'm asking them these existential questions, too. So in a broader sense, it's become more like seeking meaning through the filter of creative minds framed through his episodes in his life. So I've, I'm getting all these like amazing insights, a whole spectrum of anything from, I mean, these are questions that felt really silly to ask at first. And I just kept getting like really inspiring answers and it led me to just ask more and more. But like, you know, some people will just laugh them off. Other people give you really deep, resonant responses. It's just been wild and really inspiring. This has been like kind of, a crazy journey for me and through this movie I, I really hope to share this inspiration and this meaning that I've found through this process and you know through my dad's story and him opening up him being willing to put this out there and share this stuff that I think maybe other people are dealing with too and you know it, it could be helpful I think that's great and I also think uh, and you'll forgive me uh, but uh, from a detached standpoint on my part, I've become very cynical about the traditional comic book documentary, whether it's the history of comics and in some cases even looking at a, a, a specific artist or writer. And it's what is what is different about your project, and you've just explained it. And also knowing these five-year episodes that your dad has to go through, the apparent joy that's in his work. And it's very interesting to hear that there is the this sad dark side to it as well in terms of just dealing with identity, as you say, and things that we might have, you know, just thought, oh, how creative for that, you know, issue of Mad Men or everything. And then it's like, no, there's more going on there. And that's that's amazing and certainly worthy of, of a documentary kind of uh, exploration. So that's that's good good on you, man. I think that, like, my dad, he'll straight up say that he thinks he's mentally ill. I personally think he's a modern day shaman i think that like the depths of these episodes the suffering leads to great growth in his character and him as a person he is this vibrant really happy loving caring person i think a lot of who he is is because of these episodes and i know that he he doesn't want to go through them and he even just told me recently if he goes through one of these episodes again he just wants to be put down like he can't, he can't take it. But the sad thing is, it probably will happen. But I don't think that's going to happen. But I mean, it's really tough. It's it's hard for my family. It's hard for me to see him go through this. It's crazy to think that someone who's achieved so much and has so much love in their lives, both like giving and receiving, could go through episodes of such severe detachment. Like he could sense his body and he could sense people around him, 
but he's like, if anything, like clawing, trying to fight back to get to his body. And he feels like this shard of glass that's broken off from the rest of the glass, just floating off into eternity. And, uh, you know, I think maybe being raised Mormon has probably shaped a lot of that. And, uh, like certainly when I first became aware, like, so I was 18 when I first it's crazy. You grow up your whole life and your dad is the person who, you know, is making you brush your teeth, go to church, all this, all this stuff. He's the authority figure and the hero of, of uh, no man. Are you kidding? I, my father passed away when I was 17 and died from cancer. And I watched him kind of, unfortunately degenerate with the disease. And it was, it was rough, man. And uh, yeah, no, this is the rock. This is the, you know, so yeah, when you see the rock, upset and everything that's that's a lot for a kid to handle so please continue yeah so as an 18 year old witnessing that it totally changed my life yeah like all these things that seem so concrete and so real so certain like became uncertain and my rock crumbled and like i think it's it's something that is tough for all of us uh but it's also sort of been somewhat taboo of a thing to even talk about with my family. So in a way, like wow. jumping into this project, I think has been like a great opportunity for like understanding, communication, like healing to some degree. Mm-hmm. I think that my dad has found the, the process fairly therapeutic, both just like these conversations that we've had together on camera just totally open like it's been like a therapy session between the two of us as well as like you know going out there and interviewing his friends colleagues all all these other people i'm interviewing you know most people don't know the extent of some of this like inner angst and i I think it has people maybe reaching out to him afterwards and connecting with his friends on a level that maybe he hasn't yet specifically he had a conversation with Steve rude mm-hmm. like Steve I was talking to Steve rude and telling him about this stuff and he's like oh I gotta talk to your dad I gotta talk to your dad sure and and then I, I was kind of like worried like oh no <laughs> like I, I hope I hope this isn't something that like freaks my dad out and then uh like my dad told me afterwards like oh i had this great conversation with steve rude well, like, i'm so glad to hear that seemed like he seemed, seemed like he got a lot out of it and so I, I think just being open about this uh i think has been really good for him and he seems really excited with the direction i'm taking it and that it's not just this cookie cutter you know sure artist documentary and that yes he he sees what i'm after and and he seems he's very interested in all these answers that I've been getting from all these, you know, all of, all his friends and colleagues. And I've kind of been keeping them in the dark because, you know, this is. Well, you're still putting it together, like you said. Yeah, yeah. So quick second, I, I'm uh, pause on Steve Rude because I know Steve is dealing with his own demons and stuff, and I really like Steve a lot. I have tremendous respect for him, and I can I'm glad to hear it sounds like from your dad's standpoint it was beneficial. I hope it was for Steve as well. Because, again, I think these are two guys that uh, are clearly sharing a lot more in common than just comic book art as far as what they're dealing with. Yeah, I, I, you know, one of the, the main, there's a few, like, key reasons I need to do this Kickstarter. And one is to just have the funds to travel and interview people like Steve Rude. Uh, Steve, when talking to Steve, he told me he had all this great stuff that was going to help my dad and that he wouldn't share it with me until we were on camera. So I don't even know what they, they talked about, but like, but yeah, I, I do really hope to interview Steve. There's a lot of great people who, who are lined up, who are really enthusiastic about being involved in this, that it's just a matter of getting to them. Why don't you give some names of people that have committed to it once you're able to, you know, have the funds to go out and, and reach them and then be able to, you know, shoot it, shoot in-depth interviews with them. Well, I mean, I, there are some great people and there's a lot of uncertain, but I think very realistic people. I don't, I, I want to hold back from sharing any potential people. Like I've only, I've had all these people lined up that I've already 
obtained. I interviewed Kevin Smith just recently, a great interview with Matt Fraction. David Walker was, a, I mean, all these great interviews, Nick, Nick Darrington, Kelly Sue. Kelly Sue, great. Um, Joel Jones. Oh, great. So I love Joel. Yeah. So, yeah, on the website, there's a list and there's quite a few names. Uh, you know, even wild cards like Bob Camp, co-creator, Ren and Stimpy. Of course. And, and interviewed him. Uh, yeah, so it's, there's, That's there's been great, a lot man. of great, a lot of great people involved. Michael Oming. Like, of course, a wonderful interview. Yeah, I love Mike. Uh, Another great, good friend of mine. And and so I, I think realistically, like you know, I've, I'm lucky to live in Eugene and Portland being so close and yeah. a hub of this community, just as we were talking about earlier. And so I've, I've luckily it's it's been kind of like perfect to obtain the interviews that I've got thus far. But I see like L.A. and New York as these two other hubs with a few people in between. So uh, basically, Steve's like in Wisconsin, isn't he? I think so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's been a while since I've, I've seen him face to face. So yes. So I I I plan on getting a lot more interviews. And, cool. And I'm I'm just you know just digging into that rough edit. And with the Kickstarter coming, like, basically, like, with the funds from the Kickstarter, I plan to get the next batch of interviews early summer. And in the meantime, just get as deep into the rough edit as I can so that I know just what I'm missing. And come into this next batch with more focus and direction, knowing what, what I've got and what I don't. So I'm, I'm being strategic Sure, absolutely, and, man. And I and and honestly, I can make a movie. I, the film could be finished with just what I have right now. So, like, but I I do want to just dive in deeper, and yeah. So, when starting this, like, I'm I'm a music nut. I just wanted to make music for a movie, and then it kind of developed to like, well, I should just make my own movie. And the last thing I wanted to do was make a movie on my dad. Uh, and people had even brought that up, saying, oh, you should, you know, as I'm contemplating what I can make a documentary on, like, oh, you should make something on your dad. And that the idea felt cheap to me and uninspired, and I did not want to do it. And I, in a way, it feels like kind of this is a hero's journey, and I denied that first call. But uh, <laughs> Sure. But like in a moment of just inspiration, I realized what it was about and what I wanted to dig into. And the next day I talked to my dad and told him, you know, I, I really want to make this film and this is what it's going to be about. And when he showed me that he would be open to that, like I was selling off like 10 years worth of synthesizers, fine cameras and and reaching out it's been about a year now and it, it's crazy how how far this has come in that year and you're scoring the film as well that's what you wanted to do first was was music and then it's turned into you know making a film so you could do your music and now yeah even further that's great that's amazing where'd you learn your filmmaking skills well i've been a sample based musician for quite some time working with timeline editors and really i just started approaching it as like, you know, I, for one thing, being inspired by my dad and looking back at his work and, you know, it's not perfect, but being like he was willing to grow in front of people. And so that's, that's really what I'm reaching for growing in front of people. But I, I don't, I don't feel like I'm coming out of nowhere because I, I have been working with timeline editors forever and being going from sample base music to a documentary i've kind of been approaching it as like the all these interviews are my sample material and i'm cutting up and rephrasing things both with my music and to tell tell my narrative and uh i've been like deeply immersed in story structure and all this like i i'm not just loosely throwing something together and i'm reaching out for help and advice from anybody who will give it to me and I've like through like 
resources like Northwest Film Center and Northwest Documentary. I've I've met up and had all sorts of great direction from from all these fellow filmmakers that aren't comic book fans and they're not my friends and they really even seem to believe in what I'm doing. And I I think that in general like it's this this is something I'm really passionate about and and I feel like when reaching out for mentorship and such that like these people really sense my passion and they seem to even though they're not tied in any way seem to be really enthusiastic about helping so i've I've got people setting me straight and giving me direction as well as i I really I'm just trying to make something that I like myself. And I, I think I, I think I got this. Good. I'm glad to hear that because, again, I think you're right, and I know you're onto something here that goes beyond comics, and that is um, – I, I forget who I was talking to, but I was even saying um, – and forgive the reference because people are going to go, what are you talking about? But in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, uh, Cybox, Spock's character, goes to Kirk and says, let me release your pain. And Kirk's like, I don't want you to release my pain. I need my pain. And I kind of think creative people, there's something there that there's something that, um, and, and really it's a presumption of normalcy maybe on everybody. And, and the likelihood is I'm, I'm way off on this, but it just seems that like creative people, we need to, we need to get our energy behind the creative things that we do as opposed to being satisfied with a nine to five job. And because I've asked my friends who are very successful people and they've got office jobs and I'm like, well, do you really get joy out of what you do? And some have been very like, no, I don't. I, this is a paycheck and that allows me to get joy from the things I'm afford, able to afford on my downtime. And I'm like, oh, OK, that's cool. And with me, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a blue collar broadcaster. I'm no I'm no household name, but I've been in radio for most of my professional life and a little bit of television. And for me, it's just pursuing this creative stuff, and that's even what the what's behind me doing the podcast and stuff. So I think that kind of exploration of that kind of challenge that your father deals with and stuff, and then to be able to come up with the art that he does, that's a very interesting contrast, and I think it's absolutely uh, you know an area to explore. No, you're definitely onto something. I think mean, this is a great idea, and, and I'm I'm glad your dad had the the courage to be able to go on camera and talk about it and stuff. So that's amazing. Yeah, certainly. I Right from the get-go, if anything, I want to make my own art and like get out of my father's shadow, which, which makes this project feel very ironic. But uh, like, yeah, I, I wasn't looking to make a movie for his fans necessarily. Like I know there's all this great support and all these people that are really enthusiastic who to a great extent don't even realize what it's about that's great and i i love that but i really want to like tell the human story of my father and the, the human story of suffering and life and death and why are we here like why do we exist and that's I, I think that what I'm on to is something that anybody who ponders those questions or just creative types in general, whether into comic books or whatever other medium, I, I think there's going to be something for a much wider audience than just comic book readers. For the Kickstarter, what else can we talk about to help promote beyond, again, the subject? I mean, and, and you know, again, your, your dad's art is incredible, but as you say, that side of the story is the B-side and stuff. This is the kind of movie that needs to get made. So I'm, I'm very happy to help you promote the Kickstarter and everything. I just want this to get out there to people and hopefully resonate. And it, you know, those who want to support, like, I, I, I both want the accountability. I feel like the responsibility of delivering is a fire that I want under myself. And to, to share this. But I, I want to make this the best movie it could be. So the, the Kickstarter, the incentive here is I want like this to, I want color correction and I want to outsource mixing and mastering. And there's all these, you know, post expenses 
and to get all these additional interviews from inspirational characters. You want to describe some of the premiums that the supporters might get if they reach a certain level of helping you out? There's going to be like prints and I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different tiers, t-shirts, prints, enamel pins. Uh, there's going to be, of course, like viewing the movie, getting, you know, just donating just because. Oh, absolutely, man. And then there's going to be like one, one thing is like an all out, all red experience is what that's called. And that's going to be one of the higher tiers. And that's, we'll put you up in one of my parents' Airbnbs. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so, of course, like travel expenses aren't aren't going to be paid for. Like that's that's going to be on the the rewardee. But basically, stay stay in like basically a little mini version of my parents' house, uh, one of their Airbnbs, full of all kinds of cool artwork. Uh, party with the All Reds, play pinball and karaoke with with my dad and. And then and get a preview of the film with both myself and my dad on my dad's giant TV in his studio where he draws everything. Yeah, man, that's terrific. So so that will be selling the experience. So I understand. For who who wants to who wants to engage in that? And so Jim Ma Foods made a cool print that that I'm going to be putting up there. There's going to be the space face poster. Uh, there's Joelle Jones says she has some artwork for me to put up there. So I'm going to go up to Portland and, and grab that stuff this weekend. The Panda Brothers are donating some books. Got to go snatch that stuff up this weekend too. Uh, yeah, so I, I I think there's going to be some goodies. And uh, one thing is going to be like a, like a limited Blu-ray that is going to be like premium, limited, signed, numbered all that good stuff but it's going to be loaded with like the gear albums and astro-esque and one thing that i was thinking as a as a stretch goal if we if we reach a certain number to uh you know get my father and maybe some of the people together from astro-esque the movie he made in the 90s and and do do some commentary you know maybe even riff track-esque commentary oh that's fun oh my god that'd be amazing with the and forgive me because i really know your dad primarily through his art and everything and of course the madman uh comics and cartoon and everything and and his you know his work for dc and marvel over the years as well but um so the gear records were those records that he made or is there those records that you've made who you know who made those well the the gear initially was really just my dad and he, at first, he had like illustrated his friends into the band with him. Okay. I think he's still even. Oh. I think he's. At, at first, he tried to like play it off like there was a band, but really, it's just him with a multi-track recorder. Okay. And a drum machine, and and then. Did he make comics uh, then of some, the of the band's event? Like, was that his monkeys basically, or whatever? Well, the gear would have been illustrated throughout, like Madman, and like it. It's been written oh. in the comics. I but see. Then, okay. Uh, he, All right. He started, to il- he started to illustrate my brother and I into the band <laughs> way, bef- way before we did anything with him. And then uh, maybe about 10 years ago, he, my brother and him started putting something together and I jumped in and collaborated as well. And uh, So there's that, that last gear album really is the three of us. That's amazing. And then my stepsister has stepped in and played bass for some shows. And so we've performed. And oh, you know, and I'm slapping myself. Of course, I did know that Mike performs at, at shows as well. That's amazing. That's fantastic, dude. And so, like, are people able to buy those albums now and everything? Are they, like, does your dad keep them in, you know, in stock and everything and that people can buy them from? Them? I'm sure they're on, like... You know the Apple Store or something like that. Okay. Or on okay. iTunes, I bet. But they they will be digitally available through this Kickstarter. Fantastic! That's great to hear. And there's yeah. another reason to, to bump a little bit more of a uh, donation so you can get access to those things. That's great. And of course, we'd rather buy them from you to to support to support the movie and stuff like that. That's terrific, man. That's amazing. Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean. This this movie's happening one way or another. So like, <laughs> good. For, hey, like honestly, Han, that is yeah. excellent to hear, 
and fantastic, man. Good for you. There's nothing. There's no reason for it to stop you, and that's great. But absolutely, we want you know continue. We want. I mean, we, we want to be able to help you so that it can be the best movie it could be. Yeah, yeah. I I, I just want to you know get more people involved and you know have have this be top tier as polished as it could be, and of course, like a big big factor like a, a priority is getting a lawyer involved. Uh, I don't know if people realize how expensive documentaries could be, but when it comes to archival footage and all this stuff that needs to be licensed out, sure. Like I, like it's, it's crazy to think people can make documentaries, but, uh, like I'm, I'm going to have to, of course, make plenty of use of fair use and sure. Uh, and I'm going to need a, a lawyer involved to to get that all a okay. You're 100 percent right in terms of needing that because people are so protective of their intellectual property to be used in any way. Has of Marvel and DC? Have you contacted them yet, and then gotten any sort of you know agreement in terms of what you want to do to show that portion of uh, Mike's work? For the most part, you know, Madman's the biggest key part here. Uh, and luckily, I think Madman, I have full permission to use. And, and, uh, yeah, so I, I, no, I have not reached out to them, but, uh, I, it's not anything I plan on extensively using. And when we're talking like Time Warner and Disney and all that. Well, and that's where fair use hopefully can come in in terms of showing some covers or whatever and be like, well, well you I, know. He did this. I mean, so yeah, hopefully there's a fair use avenue for you to get it from that capacity and everything. Well, as a musician, I really find it inspiring to work with limitations. And I understand. I, I, I totally understand. I, I, feel like, I feel like that's actually something that will work out to my advantage creatively, knowing that like I to use something, it's going to have to actually like, you know, illustrate my point and be be within reasonable use of fair use if I'm using anything outside of the trip, the triple A pop madman universe. And that's the great thing about your dad's stuff too. It is so distinct and so beautiful. I love, there was some, and I don't know if you've ever seen these within the last 20 years, there was a great documentary about that art movement that they called lowbrow art. And it was really like, you know, the kind of crazy stuff that would be on, dune buggies and surfboards and especially like in the 60s and 70s and that culture and it's so vivid and again your dad's style i mean and the madman universe obviously illustrates that as well but i mean that's the great thing is your your dad's style is so unique and so eye-catching already that it's i mean it it it's wonderful to have that you know kind of as the base of of the movie and stuff and showing the art i mean that's gonna be incredible yeah i mean I, we're talking three decades of of, of all red art. So there, there's a lot, a lot to work with. And, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited to, to make this. And I, once again, like I've found this whole process to be so inspiring and give me a sense of meaning. And I really hope that through it, that I could share this inspiration with others, uh, you know, just through, all these, all these amazing insights from really cool, creative people. Well, the Kickstarter, because you're peering in now, folks, is up and running. And uh, I, I absolutely am uh, behind this and happy to help Han out and, and Mike and Laura and to tell Mike's story. And any, yeah, any, anything you need uh, from Word Balloon, please, uh, please let me know beyond uh, this podcast. But uh, good luck. I, it sounds like you, you know what you want to you know, accomplish with this film. And your determination comes through as well. So that's that's terrific. I appreciate you letting us know about this and uh, the call to order for the League of Word Balloon listeners to go and uh, support this uh, this project. And and again, is it called Space Face? Is that the name of the documentary? Yes, Space Face. You could go to spacefacemovie.com. And on spacefacemovie.com, there's a list of those who are already those who have been interviewed and as I interview others, they will be added to that list. Excellent. And, and of course, like one of the benefits of being part of the Kickstarter is going to be getting all the updates. So like getting the inside scoop, seeing things move along. 
and uh, yeah, I think it'll be worth contributing for those who are interested just to see uh, you know the progress of this film as it happens. That's terrific, Han. Honestly, I, I'm I'm really glad you're doing this. It sounds like the project is meeting what you know your your expectations are, and it's great to hear. The least likely thing that you would want to do a movie about might be like a, a great thing for you and and spur you further. So really, good luck and. Uh, like I said, no, will we'll people go to uh, spacefacethemovie.com, correct? Go uh, spacefacemovie.com or check out Spaceface on Kickstarter. Yeah, 30-day campaign. And, yeah, ch- check it out, read the story, contribute to a, a reward tier. I think that I'm onto something really special, and I look forward to sharing it with everybody. Well, thanks for telling us uh, as much about it as you have today, Han, and, and really good luck with it. And I will be uh, monitoring uh, the the uh, progress on the project and uh, looking forward to uh, the day when uh, you're playing at the conventions or, or film festivals and we'll we'll get to see the finished movie. But but good luck with everything and uh, happy to help with this uh, conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much. There you go. Nice conversation we had with uh, Han Allred. Support Space Face. It sounds like a great project, and uh, I'm pretty excited to see exactly what Han gets on film and uh, how he puts it together. And uh, I'll be looking forward to that uh, premiere at a, at a festival hopefully coming near me. Hope you enjoyed today's episode of Word Balloon. It was all brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Great stuff coming from Aftershock. This month, John Lehman's The Man Who Effed Up Time. There's Zach Thompson's Undone by Blood. God Killers by Mark Sable. Artemis and the Assassin from Stephanie Phillips debuting in less than a month. Very excited about all this. Uh, they're going to go along with other great favorites from uh, the Aftershock catalog. Things like Dark Red from Tim Seeley and Dark Ark from Cullen Bunn and Juan Doe. There's great books from Paul Jenkins and Brian Azzarello, so many others. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and how to get these books digitally through the diamond codes. Order them through your local shop at aftershockcomics.com. Again, thanks for listening to Word Balloon. We're not done with February. Don't forget, at the end of the month at C2E2 in Chicago, I'll be uh, hosting two panels, one with the great Sven Gulli, Rich Coase, nationally televised on MeTV, the best horror TV show there is when it comes to watching great monster movies, the classics along with the cheese. Sven serves them up in a great way and I'm looking forward to having a conversation with Sven live at C2E2. And then also a great spotlight panel on Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor. I am honored to be doing that. I am a longtime fan of both of theirs uh, when they're uh, collaborating and also when they've worked separately over the years. It's always a wonderful pleasure to talk to them uh, in person or on the phone or on a podcast. So it's going to be great doing it on stage and giving you a chance to ask a bunch of questions about Harley Quinn and the great Power Girls series they did back in the day, Captain Brooklyn, uh, their individual accomplishments, you know, both of them. Great portfolios of work that I really look forward to exploring with you on this panel. So two great panels at C2E2. Uh, I'll be uh, presenting them on Word Balloon for the people who aren't going to be making the trek to Chicago. But I hope to see you there if you are. Uh, Let me shake your hand and and thank you for listening and supporting Word Balloon uh, through your listenership. It means a lot. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2020.